as you're being seated, I'm going to ask you to turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6 this morning. Now, something quickly. Uh, now, listen, uh, I preached this message about a year, year and a half ago, but it's a little bit different today. You say, well, pastor, is this a leftover message? You might say so. But you know what? The Lord, the Holy Spirit's given something new to this message this morning. And uh, I want to share it with you because I believe it's very appropriate for, for this congregation. All right? Well, in case you didn't know, this is just a little lesson for you this morning. I mentioned the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, John is a little bit different there in, in how he tells the story. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as they put the, the story together, as God inspired them to write these three Gospels, you'll notice that this comes from different versions. And we're going to see that a little bit this morning in this lesson about the feeding of the 5,000 plus. The word synoptic simply means this. Sin comes from the word S-Y-N, the Greek word sin, which simply means together. These three, uh, these three gospels are brought together, and the optic part of that is to tell us what they have seen, what has been recorded as it relates to what God inspired them to write. So this morning, we are going to go to a lesson found in the three synoptic gospels and how it's recorded and how it's visually seen from each of them. I don't know that we'll cover all three of them this morning, but two I want to focus focus on is in John and Matthew and maybe a verse or two out of Luke. So if you'll turn to John chapter 6 for me this morning. John chapter 6. Now as we get to this scene before we read this you need to understand something. That word has been brought to Jesus from the, the other disciples that John the Baptist has been beheaded. And Jesus goes off to a secluded place. He gets on a boat and he goes off. And then he's coming back. And as he's coming back, how many of you believe that everywhere Jesus is, there's always a crowd? Amen. 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 I thought, wow, Lord, wouldn't it be awesome that everywhere you send me, there would be a crowd where I could share the good news of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be awesome? How many of you would say that about yourself? You say, Lord, wherever I'm at, the Holy Spirit is with me, and I want folks to gather around me so I can share the good news of Jesus Christ. How many of you say, Pastor, I want that in my life? Amen. Do you really? Yes. Come on, do you really want that? How many of you look for those opportunities? How many when you're at Lowe's and Home Depot, and when the Lord opens up that opportunity, you take advantage of it? Or how many of you go, I just don't have time? I just don't have time for you today i got to be honest with you. When that young man was sharing with me about calling his pastor and his pastor saying, we just don't have time right now. Let me call you when it's more convenient. We'll work you through this crisis in your life. I'm here to tell you that my phone rings a lot at all hours. And I don't have a problem with that. Just please be careful. If you call me at 2 in the morning, just disregard the first couple of words that I say. I haven't got my consciousness yet, all right? And then we'll get into what the Lord has for us. But the reality is, is we are followers of His. We've talked about those two lessons that we had on the Holy Spirit, the indwelling and the gifting of the Holy Spirit. And as a child of His, that I need to take advantage of every opportunity that God ordains when He puts me in someone's path. Would you not agree with me? Whether it's at the workplace, whether it's we're eating a restaurant. How many of you have ever seen someone, and I'm really going off script here, but the Holy Spirit wants us to go this way. How many of you have ever been around someone, you come in contact with them, and you can just tell that their heart is heavy. Do you ever ask them? Do you ever just say, hey, can I just pray with you? Last night we went out and had a pizza and the place was packed. It was, I can't even pronounce the name of the place we went. I mess it up every time. But we were sitting there last night and this young lady, she was doing such a great job. Her name was Cassidy. Am I right on that, Gene? Her name was Cassidy. And I said, hey, listen, is there anything that we can pray for you about? And you know this young girl is a pastor's daughter? And I thought that was too cool. Plus, what did that do? That put us on notice not to say or do anything we shouldn't do. <laughs> Amen? Of course, she's a preacher's kid, and we know how preacher's kids are, don't we? But what a blessing it was to pray for Cassidy. She's getting ready to head back tomorrow to University of Georgia and get back in school as a junior. Of course, we're going to pray for her because she's a bulldog. Amen? <laughs> All right. We won't get into that conversation either. The reality is this. Jesus gives us opportunities. The Holy Spirit gives us opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And everywhere that Jesus went, there was a crowd. 
And there, as we get into this lesson this morning, we see that the crowd is gathering, and not just a small crowd. We're talking about thousands, thousands of people. Why are they coming to Jesus? Because they heard he was a healer. How many of you want to meet the healer this morning? Amen. This young lady yesterday, as we were eating at the All-American Hamburger, what a wonderful lady she is. I've seen her many times, and, and just the opportunity that she felt comfortable enough to share with me that she was having surgery. And we said that we would pray for her and keep her in our prayers. God always ordains opportunities for him to be a witness in our life if we'll just open our eyes. So anyway, Jesus now is, is, is at, at the seashore just off of Galilee there, and the crowds are gathering around. If you'll pick up with me, please, pick up with me in John chapter 6 as I go to it in the Word of God right here, verse number 1, and it says, After these things, what things? Those things that I'd already told you about that Jesus has already been told about John the Baptist. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, a large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, Where are we? Where are we to buy bread? so that these may eat. Now, isn't that an interesting question? Isn't that an interesting question that Jesus asked of Philip? He says, and now listen, they're up on a mountain. Now, I don't know, know about you, but there was no Circle K, no Ingles, no Publix, no Kroger, nothing around. And Jesus says to Philip, where are we that we could buy some food to feed these people? Now, what do you think Philip's probably thinking right now? You've got to be kidding me. I gotta be honest with you, that's what I would have been thinking. Jesus, really? Can, can you not see around? There's nothing here. you got to be kidding. Now, I just want to pause there for a moment. What has Jesus asked you to do? And how many of us have responded, you've got to be kidding me? Jesus, you, you don't, can, can you see where I'm at right here? Can, can, can you see what's going on in my life? You've got to be kidding me, Jesus. And he goes on, notice this. This he was saying to test him. I underlined that in my Bible. Anytime the Lord has ever asked me to do something, wants me to do something, calls me to do something, I go to this verse number six right here, underline my Bible. You see, as I, I write out kind of notes in, my, in the Word of God here. I've got an underline here that he was testing him. Testing him. Well, what does that mean? See where his faith is? Is he willing to answer the call? Reckless abandon in serving the Lord and his faith? Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe the Lord's asking you to do something, and he's saying, all right, now listen, I'm putting you to the test. Are you willing to do it? Are you willing to, by faith, live your life for me? So this he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. You see, Jesus, Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Nothing is, 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 nothing is uh, how can I say this? Our finite minds have a hard time understanding the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. God would never ask us to do anything that he cannot equip us to do and cannot take care of it and make it happen. He would never do that. He's already got the wheels in motion. He's just wanting to know if we're willing to do it. And Philip answered him, well, we got 200 denarii worth of bread. Uh, uh, excuse me, he says, 200 worth of denarii of bread is not sufficient for them for everyone to receive a little. In other words, Philip was saying it would take about eight months wages just to get enough money, and that still wouldn't feed everybody. Has God ever asked you to do something? And you say, well, Lord, now wait a minute. You just don't understand this. I'm not ready to do it. I'm not equipped to do it. I don't have the money to do it. I'm not old enough to do it. I'm too old to do it. What was Philip given? Begins with an E. Excuses. There's a great gospel song. Gospel songs come to me all the time. You ever heard that gospel song, Excuses? Excuses, we give them every day. You've never heard that song? Maybe we'll get the praise team to sing that song. It's all about the excuses why we don't serve the Lord. Excuses about why we can't come to church. Anyway, Philip's giving him excuses. We, we, there's eight, eight, years, oh, excuse me, eight months of wages, we couldn't feed him. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad over here who has five barley loaves and two fish. Isn't it amazing how 
Andrew's probably like, like me. Wherever food is, I'm, my eyes are focused on it. You know, I can just picture Andrew. Oh, 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 Lord wants to feed somebody. I can see a young man over here. He's got five loaves and two fish. There's a lad who has five loaves and two fish. But where are these? But well, what are these for so many people? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in a number of about 5,000. Now, we always hear this story that Jesus fed the 5,000. Well, the reality is, is Jesus fed more than 5,000. I mean, if you think of just the men, think of the spouses, think of all of the children. If they only had one child apiece and had one wife, then that would be what? 15,000. That's a lot of folks to feed. That's a lot of mouths. Amen? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in a number of about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. You know what else I underlined in my Bible? As much as they wanted. Now, I'm going to tell you something. On Thanksgiving, I ate as much as I wanted. I didn't stop eating till I couldn't or didn't want anymore. That was it. I mean, I ate till I couldn't eat anymore. Now, I'm sorry about this, but my dad used to say that I was as full as a bloody tick. <laughs> you ever heard that? You'll never forget it now, will you? I was full. I was full. And I want to tell you what. I love to know that Jesus can give me more than I could ever want. I underlined that in my word. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up, them up and filled 12 baskets with the fra fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verses 15 through 20. Matthew 14, 15 through 20. See it from the perspective of Matthew. Oh, I love to hear the papers of the Word of God, those pages rustling. Matthew 14, 15 through 20 simply says this, When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate, and the hour is already late. So send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Isn't it amazing that, that Matthew captures that part? Where the disciples say, well, Jesus, there's too many people here because they're hungry. Why don't you go ahead and send them away? You ever thought about that in the ministry? Maybe what God's asked you to do. Well, Lord, that's just going to be too difficult. Why don't you get somebody else to do it? Lord, I ain't got time right now. Get someone else to do it. The disciples, I mean, they'd already gathered within their own mind thinking, all right, Lord, there's nothing we can do. The hour's late. There's nothing around here. So why don't you just send them on their journey? And Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them to me, ordering the people to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed the food, and breaking the loaves, he gave them to his disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. They all ate and were satisfied. They all ate everything that they could ever want. They were filled. They picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. What an incredible message. I thought about Thanksgiving. And this morning, I brought some of the leftovers from Thanksgiving. I've already had a few folks coming and dipping their finger in my food. Man, we had turkey and, and we, had, we had mashed potatoes and gravy. And, and the gravy was in the refrigerator, so it's starting to just kind of get a little bit room temperature and melt there over the over the stuffing. And that looks so good, doesn't it? How many of you right now like to have a bite of it? 
And right here, man, this is an incredible cheesecake. Uh, Penny Navin, I had asked her to make me a cheesecake. I saw it on uh, Facebook. She published that thing on Facebook. Some of you may have seen it. And I said, I'll provide the nuts if you'll make it. But she made it and brought it over, and I didn't even have to go give her any nuts. And, and folks, that is so rich. It's more than satisfying. And I began to think of this young lad who had these five loaves of bread and two fish. And 15,000 plus people, and, and thinking of his, his disciples who had already witnessed all these incredible miracles that Jesus had already done. But was this something beyond what Jesus could do? I mean, he could heal the sick, he could raise the dead, but I mean, could he actually take five loaves of bread and two fish and feed over 15,000 people? Is that possible? Can God do that? Let me ask you that question. Can God do that? Well, you say, well, pastor, he did it. It's in the book. Well, if it's in the book and you believe that, can God do that in your life? Yes. Can God do the impossible in your life? Yes. Because that's impossible to me. Anybody ever made, uh, made food for a group of folks and asked them over? Anybody ever done that and worried that there wasn't going to be enough to go around? And so you watched everybody. How many of you are like me or the last one? Well, <laughs> used to be not anymore. I try to be the first now. But you kind of set off to the side and, and you're thinking, okay, I want to make sure enough goes around because if there's not enough, what do you do? You go without. You do without. Not only was there enough, but there were leftovers. Isn't it great when God provides leftovers? There's so much that God has it overflowing. Now, there's three things I saw in this lesson, and I want to share this with you this morning. Three things I want you to write this down. Number one, I want you to notice that there was this little boy who had five loaves and two fish. Doesn't sound like very much, does it? How many of you have ever thought to yourself, Lord, you want to use me? There's not much of me. I I'm not educated. I I'm, not, I'm not the best-looking guy in the world. I can't, I can't speak very good. It seems like I remember that in the Old Testament with somebody too that said he had a problem speaking too and God used him to deliver the Israelites out of the hands of Egypt, did he not? Y'all remember what his name was? Yeah. Remember? He said, but, but, but Lord, but God, I, I, I'm not good with my tongue. Let me ask you a question. What is it God wants to use in your life? Now he had a little boy right here he had a little boy with five loaves and two fish, and he took those five loaves and two fish. Why did he take? Well, first off, let's back up for a minute. He didn't take it. What do you think that little boy did? Gave it. He gave it. He gave all he had so God could use it and multiply it. Now, now listen, I wrote this down in the Word of God. I want to give God all I have so he can multiply it. I want to give him all I have. If I've only got five loaves and two fish, I want to give it all to him so he can multiply. So number one, I wrote in my lesson for this morning for you today, I wrote down that this little boy, he gave very little so God could do very much. He gave very little so God could do very much. Where is that in your life this morning? Are we willing to give God no matter what we have so he can do more with it? And number two, I looked at this other part of the lesson that we have this morning. And the other part of the lesson is simply this. God will often take what he has given that is more, and there will always be more left over. How many of you would say this morning, Pastor, I am blessed? How many of you say, I am blessed? How many of you this week had an incredible meal? You were blessed with an incredible meal. How many of you would say this week that you ate more than you should have eaten? How many of you have already, you already got your New Year's resolution? You're going to buy a gym membership and use it for about two days and never go back again. Yeah, that's usually what happens. But isn't it amazing how God has blessed us? Have you ever, I hope that you did. I wrote it in the little note that I sent out to you this week. How many of you went around the, the table this week and you thanked God for what you have? Amen. How many of you, your mind was flooded with all of those things that over this year that you haven't thanked God for and you really realized how really blessed you are? How many of you say, Pastor, I am blessed more than I could ever imagine? Amen. More than I ever could ever imagine, Lord, I'm blessed. 
Not only did God bless them and feed them, but there was leftovers. And then the third part of the lesson this morning, I wrote that Jesus will always satisfy. Jesus will always satisfy. Can, can, can any of you ever think of things that you have gotten, that you've bought, things that maybe you've done, and that just wasn't enough? Now, I've got to be right up front with you. Now, now, here's this plate of food. I want you to think with me just for a moment. I want to see if I can illustrate this for you. Now, here is this plate of food. Jordan, don't that smell good? You want a bite, don't you? No. No, really? Well, good. I'm not going to share it anyway. Uh, but now, here's this plate of food. Now, and I just took this out of the fridge, so if anybody wants it, it's still good. It's, it's just starting to thaw out. You can see the gravy. Man, I made that gravy, and that will stick to the... St it, 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 it's some good stuff. <laughs> it's good stuff. And uh, listen... Now, I ate me a plate of this. All right, let's be honest. I ate three plates of it. I literally ate till I could not eat anymore. Sam, you ever done that? Yeah. Can anybody testify that y'all did that this Thanksgiving day? I did. Did you do it too, Clayton? I'll see you in the gym tomorrow. All right. Man, it was so good. And we all looked at each other at the table. Oh, stretch back. I had to unbutton a couple of buttons. <laughs> and man, that was good. And we sat around and we talked at the table about all the blessings and, and enjoyed each other's company. And about 45, well, for me, it was about 45 minutes later. Guess what? I wasn't satisfied. You see, I had eaten till I couldn't eat anymore. But I wasn't satisfied. Because I knew Penny had made me a cheesecake. <laughs> and I saw it. Susan had all the dessert sitting over on this table. And I looked over there, and that thing was calling me. I heard my name coming from that cheesecake. And I went, and I cut me a piece. And it was bigger than this. Now, there was a piece that fell on the floor. I was so excited. <laughs> and I thought, okay, three-second rule. Don't worry about it. All right. And that thing, man, it, uh, and I ate that cheesecake. Now, it was good, and I hope you understand the illustration here this morning. That's all right. It's delicious. See, I planned on that to happen. It was delicious. And then later that evening, everybody went home. And I was sitting there looking at the two dogs. Guess what? I was hungry again. And I went and made me another plate. There was either another piece of cheesecake on the plate. You know why? Because I wasn't satisfied. That ever happened to you? That ever happened to you? See, the reality is, is that God will provide. We can always be satisfied in Jesus Christ. And the great thing about that is, there is leftovers for us to tap into. How many of you are thankful for the leftover blessings that God has for you? So this morning, if you look with me, look at, look at Mark. Now, we haven't gone to Mark. Look at this. Part of the Synoptic Gospels, Mark chapter 6, verse 42, it says, They all ate and were satisfied. Mark 6, verse 42 and 43, it says, They all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up the twelve baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. In Luke chapter 9, verse 17, and it says, And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up the broken pieces and, they, and the leftovers which were picked up and put into the twelve baskets. In John chapter 6, verses 12 through 13, and it says, When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments so nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up in twelve baskets full of the fragments, the five barley loaves, and the two fish that were left over, or the fish that were left over. Out of all those that who had eaten, because they were all satisfied. And I thought to myself, there was this young man, gave of his barley loaves and fish, so God could use it and make more. So much so that there was plenty to feed everyone. And not only plenty to feed everyone, but the disciples went back and gathered everything up, and there were still leftovers, as if they were never touched. I don't know about you, but I love those blessings from God. Every time I look at my grandchildren, I'm so thankful for the blessings that God's given in them. Every time I go out and I stick the key in the ignition of the car, or today you push the button, I'm thankful that God blesses and it fires up. Every time I go put my shirt on, I'm so thankful 
that my lovely wife is gracious enough to, to have washed my shirt. Anybody ever thank your wife for what she does, your spouse? Boy, what an incredible meal she fixed too. I'm thankful she's an incredible cook so I can go out and buy bigger shirts. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> blessed. We're so blessed, and they just pour out on us. In fact, notice this in Psalm chapter 81, verse 10. We are satisfied in Jesus Christ. You see, this world's going to try to satisfy us, but it won't do it. But Jesus can. In Psalm chapter 81, verse 10, it says, I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I'll fill it up. How many of you knew that verse was there? How many of you like, how many just visualize this? Say, Lord, I'm standing right here. Just pour yourself out on me. But in order for that to happen, I have to be willing to what? Take it in. Take it in. I've got to be willing to be that sponge and soak it in. Hey, you know what you're doing in this service this morning? At least I pray that you are. I pray that you came in as a wrung out sponge and you're soaking up everything the Holy Spirit has for you. So you can do what? So you can leave this place and go ring it out on somebody else. Now, I'm not telling you to go ring someone else out. I'm talking about ringing Jesus out on someone else. Amen, church? Amen. We need to do that. Lord, wherever you want me to be, pour yourself out on me. Wherever you want me to be, Lord, let use me. Lord, here I am. I'm just a couple of loaves of, you know, a couple of fish and some barley loaves. Just use me, Lord. Pour me out on someone. Make me a blessing to someone today as you have blessed me. Look at John chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water, you know who he's speaking of here, right? Remember the woman at the well? He says, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. Well, let's just pause here for a moment. How many of you are still drinking of the water from the world? How many of you are thirsty? How many are thirsty? My goodness. Hey, listen, uh, some of our family members went off to, to Mickey Mouse World for this week. Now, let me tell you what I like about amusement parks. There is not a roller coaster too fast or too scary that I will not get on. But you see, for me to do that, unless I go with another couple or another family, I have to do it alone. <laughs> Susan won't do that with me. And I beg her to go with me. She says, Come on, honey, it's fun. It's a... She says, oh, no. Uh, no way, I'm not going to do it. I said, but i got to go by myself. She says, I'll wait right here for you. And she will. She's, she's such a good trooper. She'll stand there and she'll wait for hours while I go around and around on these roller coasters. And I'll get bored with one and I'll go to another one. You know why I get bored with that one? Because it just doesn't satisfy anymore. The thrill is gone. Does, that, does the world kind of do that to us? We try things out and then all of a sudden the thrill's gone. There's just no fun in it anymore. How many of you would agree with me that's where you once were until Jesus became your life? Amen. And then you realize that Jesus can satisfy your soul. Again, another great song. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only Jesus can. I love that story. That, 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 that gentleman had no idea what the message was about today when we were there at Lowe's. You see, he had, he had reached out even to what he thought was a brother in Christ. And that brother in Christ let him down. But yet he went to the thing that he knew would never let him down. In that very moment that he's about to take his own life, there was the word of God and he opened it and he knew that Jesus would never let him down. He knew Jesus would satisfy. Jesus would meet the need. Jesus would take care of him. I don't know about you, but I want him to pour himself out on me. I, I, there's been a time in my life that I've thirsted for the world. And look at verse number 14. And Jesus said, but whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never thirst again. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water, springing up to eternal life. Anybody ever dug a well? You know what's really cool about a well? Now, I had a well dug when we lived in Monticello, Florida. They went down. Now, we lived in Florida, and they still went down, what was it, on 230-some feet in Florida. I, thought, I was always told that you go down like five feet and hit water. Not in Monticello, Florida. 230-some feet, and they hit water. And it was the coolest thing when they hit water. You know what it did? I thought we got oil. We're rich. But no, it's just water. But I don't know about you, but if I'm thirsty, I don't want to drink no oil. I want to drink water. Amen, church? Amen. Because water will satisfy the thirst, not the oil. Amen? Amen. 
And you know why? When we lived in Monticello, that well never ran dry. It always had water. Now, there was one time that some ants got caught in the points and it shut the well off. That's another story. But the reality is, is the well never ran dry. And I began to think about that in my life. And the Holy Spirit, I've never run dry of Jesus. Never. He's always been there to meet every need. He gives joy even in the midst of a storm. Even in some tough circumstances, there's joy. Can't explain it. How many of you, how many of you would agree with me? Pastor, I know where you're at because I can't explain it either except to say that that's all about Jesus and what he's done in my life because his well never runs dry. It always satisfies. And the woman said to him in verse number 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor will I have to come and draw again. Have me say, Pastor, I want to drink from that well. I want that well that never runs dry. I want that well that's got blessings that overflow. I want that well that there's always leftovers. Some of you will go to the refrigerator today and you're going to look at those leftovers. And you're going to say, it seems like they're never gone. You'll be eating turkey for two weeks. Maybe I see things kind of different, but it's like opening up the refrigerator of the Holy Spirit and it's always there. It's like you never touched it. It just overflows. The leftovers in John chapter 6, verse 26 through 27, Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly I say to you, seek me. Not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and you were filled. Verse 27 says, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. You see, as Jesus was delivering the message to the crowd, he had met their physical need. And by meeting their physical need, they were satisfied, were they not, church? It says that they ate till they were full and they were satisfied. And at that moment, Jesus could do what? He could deliver the message of the meat of eternal life from the well that will never run dry. Which kind of reminds me as a pastor, you know, it's one of the interesting things that we're doing, especially this time of year, as we deliver these buckets of food. I often wondered how you can meet a spiritual need when someone has a physical need. You ever met those folks? You ever met those folks that have a need and, and then there are those that we consider ourselves to be super spiritual and we say, hey, listen, if you pray about it, God's going to turn your electric on. And then we walk away. Hey, if you pray about it, God's going to bring you some food. And we walk away. It seems as though Jesus gave us that lesson. It was called the good what? Y'all remember that? The good Samaritan. How can we meet someone's spiritual need and share the good news of Jesus Christ until we're willing to first meet their what? Physical need. That's showing and sharing the love of Jesus, is it not? What a great example. Jesus knew they were hungry, and what did he do? He not only fed them, but he filled them. And then what could he do? He says, hey, listen, that was good, but let me tell you about something that's better. Let me tell you about a well that's never going to run dry. Let me tell you about the bread of life that you'll never hunger again. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, it says this, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and his choosing in you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. How many of you this morning would say, Pastor, I am walking in the journey that God has set out for me to walk in? There was one amen that came out of that this morning. That means some of you are kind of questioning where you're at. Now, what an interesting thing that, that to Jeff has challenged the church that beginning December 1st to read the entire book of Luke, taking us into the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then as we get to January, we're going to pick another book that we're going to read. 
and for the next two years read entirely through the Bible. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you have been filling yourself with the Word of God? You see, even as Jesus said, you've been eating the food that will nourish this body, but have you been eating the food that will nourish your spiritual life and your spiritual walk? My dear friends, this is the bread of life. This is the blueprint for your life. John 10.10, 10, we know that verse. I've quoted that verse many, many times. It says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. How many of you... Now, i got to be honest with you. I know we live in the mountains of Georgia, but I still lock my doors. And when we moved up here, I did what I had in South Florida. I have an alarm system, and it's on right now. And we were out of, it was kind of funny, we went out, what was it, last night, had pizza, right? We went out last night with Gene and Jan, had pizza last night. And, and when we came into the door, there's one door where the dogs are at in the back room. And, and I was in such a hurry to go get the dogs out, I thought Susan, I'm going to blame her for it, I thought she had turned the alarm off. She's back there, oh, he always does. But she didn't turn it off, and I didn't turn it off. And I opened up that door, and all of a sudden the bells and whistles started happening, and this little voice, not little voice, it's a strong voice, it's blasting out, intruder, intruder. <laughs> and I'm thinking, no, it's my house. But anyway, that thing starts going off, and so I get all the stuff turned off, and I'm standing by the phone waiting for, it to, waiting for that call from the, from the alarm people. And it never came. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. They always call. Within minutes they call. You know, and all of a sudden the phone rings. I picked it up, and it was Gene on the other end of the line. Marty, I got the alarm people on the phone. What's your password? I'm thinking, why did they call Gene? And I forgot we'd gone out of town, and I gave him the information or gave them the information for Gene. That was interesting. I thought. He said, "Well, Pastor, you live in the mountains. We don't even. How many of you don't lock your doors? Come on, let's see who you are. I uh, see. Look, we live in the mountains. We don't lock our doors. I lock my doors. My car's locked." How many of you have an alarm system? How many of you have it on right now? My Sunday and I have mine on. Why is that? Because I know that there, hey, I was in law enforcement 28 years. Because I know there are people out there that are, that are willing to what? Come and steal from me. I worked hard for what I have. I don't want them to steal from me. Now, isn't that a great, how the Lord gives us this example for us to understand? There's a thief out there that wants to come and steal and kill and destroy your life. Who is that church? That's Satan. But now look here. Jesus says, I came that you'll have not only life, but what? Abundant life. So now help me out here. He not only sets the table and he feeds us, he gives us life. But what else does he give us? What's it say? Abundant life. He gives us leftovers. I love leftovers. I love the abundant life. I love when I can go to his table and it never runs dry. I love it when I can open up the refrigerator of the Holy Spirit and it's always filled. I love it when I can go to his well and it's the tap has always got water in it. There's always leftovers. Always the abundant life that Jesus has for us. Well, I love Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving because it's an opportunity not just to gather around the table and eat an incredible meal, but it's an opportunity for us to sit and recap what God has done in our life through the course of this year. And sadly, it should not be the only day that we take time to give thanks for what Jesus has done. It should not be the only day, the only moment that we give thanks for the abundant life that we have in Jesus Christ. It should not be the only day that we give thanks that God could take someone like me and use him for his glory. And he wants to do that in your life. He wants to do some incredible things in your life. He wants to pour himself out on you, as we talked about in the last couple of weeks, about the indwelling and the gifting of the Holy Spirit. But he wants to just let it ooze out of you so he can use it for his glory in the lives of other people. Go to with me in prayer. Father... As we come to this time, as we gather around your table, Father, I'm so thankful, Father, and the lesson that we learned this morning, 
that, Lord, no matter who we are, no matter what we have, Lord, you can use us. You can use us abundantly. So much so, Lord, that, Father, that there's going to be leftovers. And, Lord, you don't want the leftovers to go to waste because, Lord, there's more that you want to pour out on others. So, Father, I pray that you pour yourself into us today just so we can go out and be a witness for you. And that, Lord, we will fear not because, Lord, we know that you're with us. You're walking right beside us, Lord, preparing the journey ahead. And, Lord, we can always be satisfied in you, never hungry, never thirsty. And, Father, that's my prayer for those in this room. Father, we've gone around the room this morning and we've just, we've offered praise. And Lord, I'm so sorry that we don't do that more. Because Lord, we are so blessed. We are abundantly blessed. Lord, I've heard this morning those that have been healed. Those, Lord, who have seen renewal in relationships. Those, Lord, who have found in this family, another family. Someone to love them, accept them. To be a part of their life. Those who have found love and joy in this family right here. Oh Lord, just continue to pour yourself out into this fellowship. Lord, so not that we keep it within these walls, but Lord, that we'll, as Shirley said, that we can take it out to the parks. We can plant it, Lord, in these buckets and we can send it out so others will see that, Father, this is a church that practices the Word of God, by how we live it in showing the love of Jesus Christ and sharing it. So Father, I'm going to thank you for what you've done today. I thank you for your leftovers. I'm thankful, Lord, that you never run dry. You never run empty. 